Welcome to our UFM webinar on economic opportunities and skills in the post-pandemic horizon. It's a webinar that we chose to call or to give the name of Reasons for Hope. Hope there is. And we very much hope that by the end of this webinar, you would agree with us that this was an aptly chosen name for the webinar. And while we're still on names, my name is Mohamed Razez. I'm an Egyptian professional based in Barcelona, where I work for the Economic Development and Employment Division of the Union for the Mediterranean, to be more accurate for the Secretariat of the Union for the Mediterranean here in Barcelona. And together with all my colleagues at the UFM Secretariat, we very much thank you for having joined us today and we hope that this webinar will be up to your expectations. We hope that it will be inspiring, interesting, and even better, thought-provoking. Now, a tiny logistical note at the beginning, just to set the path for this webinar. You will have noted that you are all set to mute and that you cannot share your videos. I hope you're not annoyed by this. It has to do with the modality and with the sequential logic that we follow for this uh, webinar. Basically, it has a duration of one hour. I will be talking for around 40 minutes. Then you will be given the floor to share questions and comments through text. So I encourage you all throughout the webinar to send us questions. You will see a little function at the bottom of the screen. There's a button called Q and A, questions and answers. Feel free to share, to share with us any questions, should you have any, and also to share comments. Then, during the last 20 minutes of the webinar, my colleague, Mr. Glenn Cowenbergs, who is helping me today, will share with me some of these questions. We will try to answer as many questions and cater to as many comments as possible, but mind you, we're limited by the time set for this webinar, which is one hour, as I mentioned. However, there can always be a follow-up to this webinar. This is a pilot webinar, but we would be very happy to have a part two and three. And I'm glad to announce that this is the first of a series of webinars that we will deliver over the coming months. Now, some of you might not be very familiar with the Union for the Mediterranean, its secretariat, its activities, its mission, so a little something on the Union for the Mediterranean by way of introduction. The Union for the Mediterranean is an intergovernmental organization that brings together 43 member states, namely all the member states of the European Union, in addition to countries from the Balkans and from the Middle East and North Africa, the MENA region, Southern and Eastern Mediterranean countries, with the mission of promoting regional cooperation and integration towards the greater end of creating an area of peace, stability, security, prosperity, and well-being for all. We have two pillars for our work. One of them is human development, the other is sustainable development, and under each we have a set of priority areas of action that were identified and mandated to us by the member states. The Union for the Mediterranean was launched in 2008, its secretariat in 2010, but it traces its origins back to 1995 and the famous Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, otherwise known as the Barcelona Process. And as such, this year, this very turbulent year, I'm afraid, it marks the 25th anniversary of this process. Now I can finally proceed to the first part of the webinar. And please allow me to share with you my screen here so that you can also see the slides. And we will start with a little bit of context, something about the socioeconomic impact, something about the macro picture. Now, I would like to start with a quote by a very prominent Polish thinker He's a famous sociologist called Zygmunt Bauman. Let's read together this quote and then we talk. Zygmunt Bauman tells us that questioning the ostensibly unquestionable premises of our way of life is arguably the most urgent of services we owe our fellow human beings and ourselves. Now, Zygmunt Bauman is very famous for having coined a term that corresponds to a concept 
the concept of liquid modernity, in which all forms change shape and form too quick and too rapidly for anyone to follow. Now, I dare say that we have moved from a liquid modernity to an ethereal modernity, and it seems that this development is a natural inevitability. In 2008, we were hit hard by a global economic crisis that left no stone unturned. Basically, it forms part of our modern prehistory now. And the whole world had to pay a very hefty price. Now a new global crisis is brazenly intruding upon our dream. And every day the paper boy brings more. Every single day on TV, we see very solemn people with long faces sharing with us drastic statistics, desperate measures. And it would seem as if we're being signaled into staring into the steel stairwells of despair. This comes at a time when the World Economic Forum tells us that of all the skills deemed essential today, 35% would be obsolete in five years. In five, not in 10, not in 20, in just five years time. This is the day after tomorrow, if you may. Now this uncertainty, it leads to confusion and to anxiety, but we believe that there are reasons for hope and we believe that there will be opportunities to be sought in the aftermath. Because if anything, history has taught us that behind every global crisis, there lurks an opportunity. It could be a once in a lifetime opportunity. It could be a one in a decade opportunity, but there is an opportunity. This was the case with the Russian crisis. It was the case with the collapse of the Latin American central banks. It was the case with the Asian tigers crisis. It was the case back in 2008 and 2009. And the current global crisis will be no exception to that. As you well know, the current crisis has hit different countries and regions of the world disproportionately. The impact has not been even across the world or even within the same regions and sub-regions. There are many factors that we can name, and some of them include structural vulnerable, uh, uh, or better said, structural economic vulnerabilities. It includes high external debt, poor healthcare service, low technology penetration, deep socioeconomic inequalities that unfortunately were further deepened by the current crisis, but also supply chain models where some countries are heavily dependent on value chains controlled or led or dominated by China and Southeast Asian countries. But it's not only the countries and the regions that are affected unevenly. This extends also to individuals. Some individuals have been and will be affected more than others. And there are again reasons for that. Among other things, people with a single skill set, people who have not been able to upskill or reskill will be hit harder than others. And with this short introduction, I can now move to the second part of this webinar, which has to do with the opportunities. Let's talk a little bit about these hope for opportunities. Now, as the whole world awakens to the immensity of what it has lost and what it still stands to lose in the aftermath of the current pandemic, the case for a transition to a low carbon economy becomes crystal clear. It becomes as evident as Euclid. In addition, industries that had vulnerabilities would now have to restructure, reform, or be removed. The three R's of the post-pandemic panorama. And the World Economic Forum tells us that in the aftermath of this pandemic, companies that would succeed are the ones who would be able to combine agility being agile, 
with resilience. Agility is fundamental. It means the flexibility and the ability to capture opportunities as they arise, to adapt real time, to move up the competitiveness curve. And resilience means the ability to resist. It means the ability to survive and to withstand the economic tremors and the shock waves of the current crisis. Digitalization and investing in new technologies will no longer be a matter of choice. It has actually become a matter of fact. It will be a make it or break it factor for so many companies and industries and entire economies around the world. The current supply chain and value chain models that we have in the world would have to be reconfigured. And this reconfiguration might be at one or both levels, logistically and geographically, for very obvious geostrategic and economic reasons. All of these changes are upon us. But in addition to all of these, there's a whole spectrum of other phenomena that have surged, that have come to the surface during the current global crisis, and that are likely to stick around. They are likely to stay with us towards the current year, maybe into the coming year, and maybe beyond that. I'm talking about phenomena that you're all familiar with by now. I'm talking about distant work, working from home, digital nomadism. I'm talking about video conferencing tools. I'm talking about reduced business travel. I'm talking about more flexible working hours and working modalities. I'm also talking about a renewed emphasis on the work life balance that was severely disturbed by the current crisis. Now, to land it down into something more concrete, analysts and experts from around the world seem to have a consensus about some of the great opportunities that the aftermath will bring to us in certain fields and certain areas. And I would like to share it with you all in one slide that hopefully would be serving as a, a one-stop shop or a visual reference. Of course, this is not an exclusive, exhaustive list. It's just to provide some guidelines. We are talking about fields that will provide opportunities, jobs in the aftermath, in the fields of digital technologies, tech solutions, financial technologies, fintechs, new energies, clean and renewable, obviously, project management, and I'll come to that later, healthcare and healthcare technologies, risk assessment and insurance, because unfortunately, so many countries around the world didn't see this coming, online education as an alternative to the brick and mortar classroom and lecture hall, entertainment and gaming, emotional and psychological well-being, and also supply chain logistics, because as I mentioned, they would need to be reconfigured. They would need to provide answers uh, uh, directly uh, and I don't know if, if you can still hear me and see me. Well, I, I lost my screen, but I hope you can still hear me at least. And um, if so, I'll, I'll go on. And if not, my colleagues can please uh, advise me. Um, basically, Yes, you can see me and you, fantastic, all what we need. So uh, I can't see the screen now, but it's no problem. I know my material, so let's move on. I also wanted to tell you that opportunities will be provided by other sectors and modalities. And here I would like to mention a few of them. I would like to mention digital economy, circular economy, social economy, creative economy, and, of course, blue economy. Digital economy, you all know about it. It encompasses all what has been made possible by digital technologies in the fourth industrial revolution. Circular economy, green economy, nothing new about it. But some of you might not be necessarily familiar with such concepts as social economy, creative economy, and blue economy. So please allow me to elaborate a little bit. Let's start with social economy. They sometimes refer to this as the third sector. Third after public, 
and private sectors. I personally do not like the word after because in reality, it's in between public and private sectors. It fills in the gap, the blind spot, the gray area that is left behind or in between by the public and private sector. How come? Because some sectors, some activities are not necessarily considered strategic enough for the government to step in, nor are they considered lucrative and profitable enough for the private sector to invest. So who would step in? Associations, foundations, mutual benefits, and other forms of social economy enterprises. The social economy model is a very resilient model. It proved to be so back in 2008. It's also a smart model that is inclusive, responsible, and sustainable. Because it is based on very important values and tenets, putting people over profit, transparency, democracy, participatory management, co-ownership to the end of the list. Then comes the creative economy. And creative economy is an umbrella term. It encompasses all the cultural and the creative industries and clusters that you could possibly think of. A cultural industry, yes, something classically and immediately associated with culture, like cinema, like theater, like museums, like publishing. How about creative industries? Well, they are based on three tenets, individual talent, skill, and innovation. And as such, are not necessarily immediately associated with culture. Examples, software development, toy manufacturing, crafts, industrial design. Again, the examples are so many. And the creative economy is playing a more and more important role in the gross domestic product of many countries around the world and contributing massively to the employment landscape. Sometimes we call the creative economy orange economy in, in Latin America, they call it purple economy elsewhere, the song remains the same. And while we stick in colors, there comes the blue economy. And I speak here under the authority of one of my colleagues who is the expert of the UFM on blue economy and she's joining us. Blue economy means, in very oversimplified terms, maritime economy. That is, all the value creating and the value adding activities that would be associated with the seas and the oceans, but also with the rivers and the lakes. Like what? Industries like fisheries, like maritime tourism, like maritime transport, all the highways of the seas, all the oceanic routes, oil and gas offshore, tidal and wave energy, the all form part of the blue economy. Now, for anyone living in this enchanted part of the world, in the Mediterranean region, you need to do what the Spanish ship call un cambio de chip, to change the mindset a little bit. We have been told to always gauge economic development in terms of GDP, the famous gross domestic product. But in the Mediterranean, I invite you to reconsider and to also expand your horizon and think in terms of GMP, the gross marine product. Because it so happens that our Mediterranean Sea, which accounts for less than 1% of the overall water mass on planet Earth, also accounts for over 20% of the gross marine product globally in terms of biodiversity, it's a massive cultural sphere, it's a hot spot of wildlife, and as such, blue economy is a very promising sector that you need to keep track of. Good, because I cannot see the screen, I cannot move to the next slide, but I'll tell you about it, because now is the time to talk a little bit about skills. We've talked about opportunities, about promising sectors, now we talk about skills. Skills for post-pandemic success. And I would like to share with you a Japanese saying. I'm obviously fond of quotes, but bear with me. It's a very popular saying that goes like this. When you're already thirsty, it's too late to start thinking of digging a well. And this is more than just a funny burlesque. I dare say that we believe that the global economy is heading and inching closer 
to the horse latitudes. Excuse me for fishing for such a medieval term, but I'll explain. Horse latitudes are located 30 degrees above and below the equator to the north and the south. And these are latitudes characterized by almost no wind. No wind, meaning that ships carrying conquerors, carrying soldiers of fortune and mercenaries, carrying merchants and travelers and explorers would get stuck at these latitudes for a much longer time than they would hope for. Now, in the 16th and the 17th century, tradition has it that the sailors would fling horses off board and into the ocean to save water and to save food. I know this is a very sad image, but unfortunately, the post-pandemic economy will fling all the horses into the ocean of unemployment. And mark my words, all here is not a reference to age, not at all. It's not about age. It's about skills. I'm talking about skills that do not fit anymore into the post-pandemic landscape. I'm talking about skills that are obsolete. I'm talking about single skill sets. So make sure you're not one of these old hosts. Now, if I am to talk about skills for the post-pandemic aftermath, I speak under the authority of many colleagues that are joining us today from much esteemed regional and international organizations and think tanks, talking names like ILO, the International Labour Organization, I'm talking UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and of course, ETF, the European Training Foundation, all of them strategic partners of ours, and all of them gurus on the topic. I do not pretend to reinvent the wheel or to bring something classic and have it buried as a new wisdom. Instead, what I have done and what my colleagues have done is compile all these lists of recommended skills where there seems to be a consensus. Try to strip them down, boil them down, and share them with you in six basic skills for post-pandemic success. These skills include but are not limited to, this is by no means an exhaustive list, it's just a selection of skills. We've divided them into three soft skills, meaning people skills, and three technical skills, hard skills, more on the technical side. What are these skills? Because I cannot show you the slide now that I cannot see the screen. I will tell you what these skills are, take note, and I will elaborate a little bit on each of them. The first is flexibility, creativity, and innovation. You need to be able to think out of the box, come up with innovative solutions to daily problems. You need to be flexible enough to adapt to ad hoc frameworks and modalities of work. Then comes critical thinking and entrepreneurial resilience. Critical thinking, you all know what that is. It means taking nothing for granted, questioning the hypotheses, it's very close to the scientific method of thinking, in which you want evidence-backed information based on research and scientific evidence and proof. But entrepreneurial resilience, I'm not so sure you know what this is. So in short, when you're an entrepreneur, you have to assimilate very early on that chances are you will fail. Because over 90% of entrepreneurs fail at first. And even more important, you have to accept this as part of the learning process. You will never move up the learning curve unless you accept and fully take on board this failure as part of the learning process. So being resilient, having the mental fortitude and the right attitude would help you bridge this gap and you might even end up being a serial commissioner. Then comes cultural diversity management, and emotional intelligence. Whether we like it or not, we live in a globalized world. And even now, when they are talking about a potential deglobalization, we still are and we will be a globalized world. 
whether at the workplace, at the bar, at the gym, at the beach, will be surrounded by people from all over. And at the workplace, you need to know the do's and don'ts. You need to embrace diversity. You need to respect differences. And this is where emotional intelligence and interpersonal skills come very handy. Teamwork skills, intermediation skills, negotiation skills to the end of the list. I now move to the second set of skills, the hard skills, more on the technical side. And the first of these is data literacy. Data literacy means many things. It means the ability to collect and compile data, to analyze it and interpret it, to build useful information and meaningful data sets and systems using this data, to ascertain its accuracy and to put it into a useful application. It's a whole umbrella of skills. Then comes digital encoding skills. Of course, as I mentioned, we're living the fourth industrial revolution with all the disruptive technologies that it has brought about. And that means that you need some digital literacy. You need to be familiar with such concepts as, for example, internet of things, or big data, or cybersecurity, or cryptocurrencies. Again, it comes very handy, this kind of literacy in digital technologies. And finally, project management skills. And this might come as a bit of a surprise for some. Why project management following a crisis? It's precisely because of that cause effect that many governments with limited budgets and a desire for a quick recovery will be commissioning tasks with a limited budget and timeline. And this is where project management skills get into the picture and become in demand. These are six skills that we believe will be very important for the post-pandemic recovery and the post-pandemic success. I have a few recommendations in my name and in the name of my colleagues at the Union for the Mediterranean and its Secretariat. First, if you stop developing your skills at any point in time, thinking that you have what it takes or that you're fully equipped, you end up being like a door that cannot be opened beyond a certain point. And you will never be well positioned to capture the opportunities in the post-pandemic aftermath. You can be conditioned and limited by your socioeconomic realities. We all are, I am, my colleagues are, you are. But do not allow yourself to be limited by your own imagination, because this is an entirely different story. I have a couple more pieces of advice for you. One of them is to set parallel pathways, especially young students and fresh graduates and young professionals between jobs of looking for a job now. Set multiple paths. Do not be taken captive to the one company or the one industry or the one field that you're fond of, because chances are you might not land a job in this company or industry or field. So what's the advice here? Take a job. Start, work, learn, build up your skill base and your contact base. And when the time comes, make a choice. As one expert, compress it in one phase. Work first, job first, choice later. Another thing that you need to keep at the back of your mind is the fact that the private sector, which to many minds is the utopia for finding a job, because it's lucrative, because it has many fringe benefits, because, because, it's not the only viable alternative. We have talked today about the social economy, about other sectors, and also the public sector in many countries still offers very viable jobs and careers. Now, I want to tell you just very briefly what we do at the Secretariat of the Union for the Mediterranean. I would like to showcase just one initiative of ours that we consider to be a flagship initiative. It's called MED for Jobs. We will share the slides with you after this webinar so that you can go through all the slides. And the Mediterranean Initiative for Jobs, or the MED for Jobs, is a UFM initiative that is project-based and cross-sectoral. It was launched in 2013 in Tunisia, and eventually it has developed into a fully blown pipeline of projects 
It currently has 13 labeled UFM projects under its umbrella. It has benefited over 100,000 people, mostly young people, women, and vulnerable communities, who are at the crux of our activities and our mandate at the Secretariat of the Union for the Mediterranean. And it has supported over 800 MSMEs, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. It has a very unique approach to the employment landscape because it promotes job creation and employability prospects. It supports SMEs and it fosters a culture, a culture of entrepreneurship. I can go on and on and on about our projects and initiatives, but this is not the point. I invite you to take a look at our website and mark my words. When I talk about beneficiaries and stakeholders, that means you as well, because we are your platform. If you come from UFM member state, then chances are you can be a beneficiary of our projects, or alternatively, you can present a project proposal, and if it fits with our criteria, it becomes a UFM legal project, and you get our support on it. Now, at the end of my part of this webinar, I would like to thank you very much for having joined us. I'd like to thank you for the time, and I so much hope that it was up to your expectations. I also extend my gratitude to my colleagues at the UFM Secretariat who could make this webinar possible in the first place. Now is the time to receive questions and comments, and we will try to take some of them and answer them as much as we can. But before I leave you for the questions and the comments, please do send us feedback beyond the questions and the comments, because I told you this is the first of a series of webinars that we intend to deliver, and we want it to be grassroots. In other words, we do not want to dictate the topics and the thematics. If you send us saying, for example, we want a webinar on entrepreneurship, we would be delighted to deliver a webinar on that topic. Or you say, we want to better understand the global economic impact of the COVID-19. We want to understand trade in the region. We have enough know-how and expertise in-house to pull something together and deliver a webinar on any of these talks. Again, I thank you very much, and I end with the last quote, I promise, and it comes from the great cosmologist Carl Sagan, and he says, our world is made a better place by the courage of our questions and the depth of our answers. This crisis offers us a golden opportunity to pause, to reflect, to make courageous questions, and to offer meaningful answers to us and to everyone else. This is where the scale and the beam of the scales is to be found. Thank you very much, and we we'll move to the questions and the comments that my colleague Len will be sharing with you now. Now I can finally see myself again on the screen and, uh, and see the slides. So uh, just in case you want to see what I was talking about. These are the fields that I was telling you about. And these are the six skills that we have chosen for you today. I don't know if you can see them all. And this is the Met for Jobs initiative. As I said, 13 projects, 800 SMEs, 100,000 beneficiaries, and this is the approach that we're following, and you can check it on our website. And this is the quote that I've just shared with you. We make our work significant by the courage of our questions and the depth of our answers. Again, thank you very much, and don't forget to check our website. And now I start receiving the questions. So, question by Francesca. How did you get 
to the list of sectors that you mentioned as growing, those can, that can generate job opportunities. Is this list global or specific to the region? No, this list is global. It obviously applies as well to the region. And this list comes from a variety of sources. I can cite some of them, including the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, and some business magazines like The Economist and other magazines. I hope this answers your question. In all cases, you have them as a, a slide. I'm receiving also messages to the side. I cannot attend to these now. I'll just stick to what my colleague is sending me. Question by Mr. Aziz. How did you come to consider these sets of skills as the ones needed? And do you mean needed in the region or elsewhere? No, I mean elsewhere as well. These are global skills that would be needed uh, in the Euro-Mediterranean region and beyond. Again, how did I bring them? I'm not making anything up from uh, my mind. They come from research papers and reports that were published in the aftermath of the pandemic by the European Commission, by the OECD, by many other organizations, the UNIDO, ILO, to the end of the list. By Anna. What do you recommend for young professionals who are currently changing their career path? Any tips on how to pursue different creative parts of yourself and fit in your main career path? I'll stick to the piece of recommendation that I gave earlier. Do not be stuck or taken hostage to one single path. Even if you're passionate and you believe you're qualified for one career and not the others, still keep the door open, take a job, because we're on to hard times to come. Whenever you find a job opportunity that suits you, go for it, learn, and when the time comes, go for the job that you really like. However, use the time. There are so many online courses that you can do and that you can register for from home and use this time until things become clearer. I'm taking more questions uh, by Anas. How do you think governments should support SMEs in a post-pandemic economic context? As said, businesses have experienced tremendous losses. Thank you very much for this question. It's true that SMEs are engines of a sustainable economic growth and they account for a massive percentage of GDPs for most of the countries around the world. And it's true that they need help. Many measures have been announced by governments around the region to stimulate SMEs. It comes in the form of subsidies, in terms of uh, tax holidays. And um, I know that organizations like ours, for example, with the support of our member states, we are about to organize a conference on access to finance for SMEs, being one of the most commonly cited bottlenecks and challenges to SMEs. SMEs suffer from other problems as well. Uh, asymmetric information, uh, difficulty of access to markets, to the end of the list. But yes, governments are responding. And I have to say it's a bit too early to judge the measures taken because we're not through, we're not done yet with the pandemic. I think more questions. I have one by Shada. I hope I'm pronouncing the names right. What's your view on the potential for green jobs in the MENA region? It's evident, it's massive, green jobs. Now with the green deal um, of the European Union, uh, I think it doesn't get more clearer in all the messages and the speeches and the reports that come out in the region, green economy and its promotion is on the top of the agenda. So green jobs uh, are not only an alternative or an opportunity, it's a must for a better planet. We have been talking about climate change a lot in-house, and one of the scientific reports that came out last year showed that, unfortunately, the Euro-Mediterranean region is heating up 20% faster than the rest of the world. This is basically unacceptable and unsustainable. So this is why I'm telling you the future for green economy and green jobs is huge. Um, Okay, another question. I would like to know if skills are considered even if they are not certified from your universities. 
uh, that's by Farih, I'm told. That would help me change the way I learn because I feel that if I learn that is not certified, it would just it will be just insignificant. So you asked me about the university certifications. I know uh, uh, that many online educational programs now are seeking to coordinate some sort of certificate so that these skills would come with the necessary piece of paper to attest to them. However, and frankly, because I don't want uh, to tell you something that I'm not sure about, I would rather consult my colleague here, our expert on higher education, and maybe I try to get back to you on this question via email. If you send it to us by email, I will have my colleague from higher education reply to this question. Let's see if there are more questions. Well, for the time being, I'm, I'm seeing that's it for now, uh, my colleague is telling me. So I guess these are the questions um, that we've received so far. I know that you might need some time to come up with questions to digest everything that was explained today, maybe come back to us with follow-up questions. Please feel free to do that. We would be glad to come back to you and try to answer your questions in a timely manner. As I said, beyond the questions and the comments, please remember that you can always send us recommendations for topics that you want us to cover in the coming webinars. We have experts on so many different areas of priority, not just economic development and employment. Let me tell you very quickly. We have six areas of priority for which we have six divisions in the UFM Secretariat. So we have the Economic Development and Employment Division. We have Social and Civil Affairs with a focus on gender quality, gender mainstreaming, and socioeconomic empowerment of women and youth. We have Higher Education and Research, which focuses on so many things, including innovation and mobility. And then we have also Transport and Urban Development. We have Energy and Climate Action and we have water, environment, and blue economy. These are the six divisions, and you'll see that many of the sectors are cross-cutting, so we work together and pool the know-how in-house as one team. I see that there's one question related to higher education. Well, questions related to higher education, I'd rather receive uh, um, by, by email. Uh, I see that uh, Danielle has a question. Maybe it would be better to receive it by email because we want to give you a professional answer and the correct answer. So if we receive it by email, I make sure my colleagues from higher education research could get back to you with the follow-up. It's about how do you expect the COVID-19 affecting in, in concrete strategic research and innovation agendas in blue growth on a med scale and med national level. Frankly, I don't have an answer for this question because it's very specific to blue economy on one hand and to research on the other. And I'd rather have my colleagues formulate a comprehensive answer for this one. I hope you understand that I don't want to just make up any answer because we take the questions very seriously. And for the time being, I don't see any other uh, questions or comments. So if we don't have any other questions, I'm looking also here, speaking of cultural diversity management and the richness it brings, I would like to know why the UFM limits the participation in many of its programs, especially youth, to passport holders and nationals of the countries of the Mediterranean. Well, it's, it's not the UFM that limits, and it's not true that we limit participation to only people with certain passports or with certain nationalities. It's not true. If Later, there are issues with visa issuance. It's not for us to, to handle. It's, it's not our competence at house, at home, to, to give visas. Uh, I'm having a look. Uh, I thank you for the enlightening webinar. Really informative. Thank you very much. Uh, technically, I hope the sound was clearer. Excellent. Thank you very much for this feedback. We we'll take note for the next webinar to make sure there are no echoes or any uh, disruption when it comes to the sound. Do you think education will have a higher value after COVID when looking for a job? For instance, for instance, an MBA, any certification will come handy, but it's the skills that really matter. 
because in the day to day, it's not the certificate that will get you far. It's the skills that you have acquired and that you can put into practice at work. Uh, I would like to know, yes, we've answered this one. Um, I think these are all the, the questions that I've received so far. Um, I'm receiving other messages by, uh, by uh, WhatsApp in parallel. I apologize, I cannot really split myself between what I receive from my colleague and what I receive from other participants, but I, I will always try to get back to you. Um, and I see that there are no more questions. I'm not receiving any more, so I think we might very well um, end the tier if there are no more questions and comments. Always keeping in mind that you can send up follow-up questions and feedback. We encourage you to do so. And uh, at the end of this, I would like to wish you a pleasant day. Please stay safe. Good luck with everything. And please remember that the UFM criteria is your platform. It's true that we also work on a policy dimension and on a projects dimension. But at the end of the day, please remember that we are your platform. Thank you very much. I think I will end it here. Thank you for all of those that joined and that shared the questions and comments. Again, I hope it was useful to you and we look forward to your feedback. And more importantly, we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Stay well. Thank you.